our summits are very interactive, and so it's my pleasure now to introduce David Jocelyn. Jason, David comes to, uh, to us from the Chicago Council. He has over 40 years of international development experience with expertise in designing, managing, monitoring, evaluation of programs in rural and agricultural sector and development, emergency and disaster relief, and reconstruction. Wow. Dave's career includes senior and technical management positions with USAID, Peace Corps, the Inter-American Inter Institute of Cooperation on Agriculture. I really prefer, you know, I prefer the acronyms actually, IICA. The private sector consulting firm of International Resources Group, IRG, and of course the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. David, please come and have a seat and I will turn over the session to you and for the remainder of the afternoon, Dave is going to lead us through a series of panels, so welcome. This is on. Uh, is it on? Is it coming on? Getting louder? Good. Thank you very much, Farah. We're going to be, as Farah said, uh, a little bit more leisure uh, the rest of the day. So relax, sit back, and uh, think. Yeah, this is a great pleasure for me to be invited to help with this uh, incredible event in the presence of so many experts on food security. I'm involved in this important issue because of my relationship with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and some of the things I've done in the past. Let me tell you a little bit about the Chicago Council before I ask the first panel to come up. Let me just give you a little bit about a an experience of, uh, of a uh, private effort, and this is in the United States, to make change, to make change in the, in, the, in the area of global agriculture, especially global agriculture policy. The Chicago Council is an independent, nonpartisan organization, which is committed simply to providing a safe space for discourse on global issues. In 2009, because of the uh, uh, price spikes and the uh, food crisis, as some people refer to, to it, and because there had been 20 years, basically, of neglect in investment in, uh, in uh, development of global agriculture, the Chicago Council produced a benchmark report, which was titled, Renewing American Leadership in the Fight Against Global Hunger and Poverty. The title explains what our thinking was. Our thinking was going way back when the United States, with partners, with many partners throughout the world, really did take a leadership role through, throughout the period of the Green Revolution in many uh, uh, successful global development activities. This report um, actually led, along with other efforts, uh, and, and influences to the U.S. government making a commitment to long-term effort to alleviate the burden of food insecurity felt by millions of poor around the world. It won't surprise you to know that this study called for increased public sector investment in agriculture research, education and training, infrastructure, and institutional strengthening. It also calls, called for policy changes and strengthening of foreign assistance institutions. And it won't surprise you to know that it had a very strong focus on, on gender equality and the role of women in agriculture. And you'll be less surprised when you know that the, one of the co-chairs of the, of the expert group that put that document together was Catherine Bertini, who had been executive director of the World Food Program for 10 years earlier. It seems, just as an, uh, an, an offside comment, it seems that if you want very strong speakers and very strong people working on nutrition and agriculture and hunger alleviation, one first place to turn is, as Farah has done, 
to the World Food Program. In 2009, the United States government joined its G8 partners at L'Aquila to commit significant resources to agriculture development and food security. And subsequently, in 2010, the U.S. government created the Feed the Future initiative, um, putting in the field its commitment to food security. Since then, the, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has, pro has produced two progress reports because we've been challenged to hold the, the U.S. government's feet to the fire on their commitments on food security. So each year we put out a report card on how well they're doing. Two years ago, they weren't doing very well. Last year, they were doing a bit better. But in 2011, we released a document called Girls Grow, a vital force in rural economies. I think you all have been, it's been suggested to you as one of your uh, reference materials for this, for this uh, 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 summit. Now that report was based on the recommendations of a task force, again, co-chaired by Catherine Bertini. And I think a quote from that document really tells it all. In the front page, I think you'll see a quote, if you want to change the world, invest in an adolescent girl. Now that's what we're about today. That's what we're about this week. And um, so we brought some of uh, some some folks along to to help y'all understand some of the issues related to global agriculture, hunger, nutrition. And I'd like to ask, therefore, the first panel to come up, and I'll introduce you. So Issa too asked, "Where are the voices? Where are the?" Where are the women voices? There's two coming up. The subject of the first panel is the impact of empowering women farmers. You've heard a lot about empowering women farmers. Now, the two panelists with us today, Susan Bradley from the United States Agency for International Development and Jenny Klugman from the World Bank, work for two institutions that are extremely well known for studying things, counting things, reporting on things, publishing information about topics, about um, everything under the sun in the developing world. But there are also two institutions that have a lot of activities in the field. And the writings and their documents really are based on that. And so I think it will be very helpful what they have to say today. I'd like to ask uh, Jenny to start. Jenny is uh, Director of Gender and Development at the World Bank Group. Uh, she's actually following up on the 2012 World Development Report on Gender Equality, which, uh, uh, which is supposed to be now the framework for what the World Bank does and how it does its, its, its work. Uh, if you look at her bio, and I won't go into it much further, you'll find that she is a pro prolific writer on a broad range of issues. And she has a PhD in economics. Susan Bradley is Technology Division Director in the USAID Bureau responsible for the Feed the Future initiative that I mentioned earlier. She helped craft that initiative. She has been directly involved in, in food assistance programs and disaster relief efforts in the Horn of Africa, Iraq, and Kosovo. And she has a master's degree in public health. And she's a kindred, kindred spirit of mine. She served in the Peace Corps. So, I'll let either of you start. Jenny, why don't you start? Is the, is the World Bank actually paying attention to this subject? But go ahead with your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be here with so many young leaders uh, on such an important topic. I think that there is a real need for strong leadership on gender equality around the world. 
the, gen the agenda has in many ways now been well established and I think well understood, uh, but there's a lot more I think that needs to be learnt and shared about what works uh, and what can make a difference uh, on the ground, as Dave already mentioned. So what I wanted to do was to outline a little bit about where we are globally uh, in terms of gender equality, drawing very much on the World Development Report 2012 that was just uh, highlighted. A little bit about the motivation for focusing on rural women and girls, although I don't think I need to go too much into that because I think that's quite well established. And I was also asked to tell you a little bit about what the World Bank is doing on this front and how indeed we're trying to take it more seriously. One of the key themes in my remarks I just wanted to make at the outset is that it's very important to complement and buttress advocacy with evidence. Advocacy is fabulous and I think has taken us a long way, but I think evidence, hard evidence about what matters and what works is tremendously important. And one theme, for example, is around gender equality as smart economics. That's a slogan, if you like, that emerged from the work that the World Bank was doing over the past several years, showing the economic benefits to investing in girls and women. We know that it's important human right, and where that is not being done, it's manifestly unfair. But clearly, much of those disparities had agreed, have existed for centuries, and we're continuing to persist over time. And so putting, if you like, the business case forward, I think is tremendously important, particularly in the context, for example, of the G20, talking to global leaders, talking to ministries of finance, talking to decision makers, uh, making the case about why it's smart economics, I think, can be persuasive to complement uh, the important moral arguments. So if you look at the World Development Report, and I'd encourage you uh, to do so, um, it's an important reference document, I think, drawing together a lot of evidence from around the world, we see enormous progress. And let me just give you one example, and that's to do with education. And what we've seen really over the past two, three decades is a very rapid closing of gaps in primary and secondary education around the world. And indeed, there are more women in, enrolled in college today globally than men. So there's been enormous strides there. And let me just give you a couple of examples where the World Bank has been involved. In Punjab, in Pakistan, the bank worked with the government to increase the enrollment ratio of girls from 74 uh, per 100 up to 85 in just a couple of years. So important investments were made which enabled a closing of the gender gap. In Ethiopia as well, uh, between 2006 and 2010, the ratio of girls to boys rose from 76 to 91 in just four years. So that gives you a sense of the very rapid um, uh, scale of progress, um, pace of progress which is, which is possible. But if you look at the World Development Report, and indeed if you look at the world around us, you'll see the persistence of gaps. And let me just highlight some of those which were underlined in this report. One, which is not on the agenda for today, but I think um, I would be remiss in not mentioning, is the issue of missing women and girls. There are almost four million girls and women who are missing. They're not born um, due to sex-selective abortions. They're dying at higher rates as children before the age of five, and they're also dying during reproductive years. It's almost four million women uh, and girls annually missing from the global population. That's one, I think, er egregious gap that we need to have, at least in the back of our minds in these sorts of discussions. Secondly are the earnings gaps. The average now globally is that women make only 80 cents for every dollar that a man makes. Um, and in some countries, it's actually much worse. So, for example, female farmers in Nigeria make about 60 cents for every uh, dollar that a male makes. But as we know, and as we've already been, uh, I think, persuasively uh, kind of told about, um, given equal access to uh, productive inputs like land, credit, seeds, and so on, uh, women actually uh, produce are as equally productive as men. And then finally, and I think this is the, just to put it on the agenda here, I think it's the focus for tomorrow's discussion, is the issue of uh, gender-based violence. The estimate which is presented in the World Development Report is that over 500 million women will be abused uh, over their lifetime. So again, this is, if you like, the broader picture. And these are major issues for the World Bank um, because they matter intrinsically for development, but they also matter because they're a real drag um, on, on development over time. And as we've also uh, heard about, 
where these gaps are addressed, it benefits not only the individual women and girls themselves, it benefits their families, including the boys in the families, um, economies thrive, institutions function better, and so on. So let me go into um, some of the things that the, the World Bank is doing now to follow up on this. I think it's fair to say that the bank is ramping up its efforts in these areas. Uh, I joined the bank uh, actually 20 years ago. Uh, now I worked ori originally in Russia and Central Asia, uh, lived in Kenya for some years, worked in Ethiopia and Sudan. I worked mainly on poverty and inequality issues. I think it's if I be entirely frank, I think it's fair to say that gender was not front and centre at the, all the efforts that we were undertaken, undertaking, but now we have major corporate commitments and targets to meet in terms of promoting gender equality. So last year alone, over $25 billion in operations uh, were allocated to projects which are gender informed. And that means that the operations took gender seriously into account in the underlying analysis to work out what makes sense for the operation, in the content of the operation, the types of interventions which were included, um, and all the monitoring and evaluation arrangements. So that's a major investment. It's almost 700 projects every year all around the world. And I'm also happy to say that agriculture and rural development is of course just one of the sectors we work in. We work on infrastructure, education, health, and a whole private sector development, a whole range of areas. But actually, agriculture and rural development have really been leading the way at the World Bank in terms of this work, in part because of the experience, I think, in working with communities on the ground, helping to identify the problems it naturally comes to the surface. Um, land reform is one area that we've been supporting. I think it's going to be a uh, topic uh, of, with much more expertise than I have this afternoon. Um, but we do know that women um, are disproportionately disadvantaged when it, become, when it comes to land ownership. And uh, I think the estimates are around 15% of, of um, farms are owned by women around the world. Um, and in general, the farms that they own, for example, women-headed households farms, tend to be smaller uh, than those owned by men. Um, but when we see the, the benefits of reform, we see those in several ways. One, for example, um, is increasing income earning opportunities for women. Uh, there's, a, there's a project uh, and there's an initiative next door from here in Nicaragua, for example, um, where uh, investments um, in land rose by some 35% when women were given joint titling to land. So that shows some of the ancillary benefits. Um, it also improves women's say in household decision making, and that's also been found including in, uh, in Nicaragua. So that's one kind of set of programs and projects that the bank has been supporting. I just wanted to mention one other strand of work just in these initial remarks, and that's the Adolescent Girls Initiative, uh, which has been going now for, um, I guess, less than a handful of years. It's a partnership with the Nike Foundation. It's currently being piloted in eight low-income countries around the world. Let me list those for you. Afghanistan, Jordan, Laos, PDR, Liberia, Haiti, Nepal, Rwanda, and South Sudan. It's presently reaching around 17,000 girls, and the idea is to promote a productive transition from school to work uh, for, young, for young girls and young women. Um, we all know that adolescence is a very critical stage. Um, what makes sense in these programs varies very much, depending on the country. Uh, these countries, some of them you can tell just by the list, uh, have very challenging circumstances, but it's very important to tailor what's, uh, what the program is according to the country context. So for example, in South Sudan, where I used to work, uh, which is almost entirely rural, agricultural training is an integral part of the program. And an important part of the program as well is having girls' clubs. And the early evidence from this initiative is indeed very positive. And many of the girls who are going through this program um, are choosing um, livelihoods training, um, agricultural training as part of the program. So just let me... Um, kind of finish up with three key messages to leave on the table for the discussion. And this is very much drawing on the experience that we have from around the world. Um, one is about the importance of women's access to land ownership and agricultural inputs. I think that we know that that makes an enormous difference and that can unlock a series of other steps uh, combined with kind of broader changes which are needed. 
which I've not talked about uh, yet, but I think will come up in the discussion. I think the second point that I want to make uh, relates to the process and women and uh, girls' involvement in decision making and how that can make a difference. Um, so this can take into account their, their concerns and priorities. And then finally, and this is echoing a theme that's already come up very much in the discussion so far, is about engaging both uh, women and men for the success that's, that's very important. So I've given you a range of examples, trying to give you a sense of the possibilities uh, which are around um, and we see in practice around the world. But I do want to leave you with one closing thought, and that's that closing gender gaps is not something that the World Bank can do alone. It requires enormous energy, enormous efforts at the country level, and domestic political commitment is key. Um, we've already heard, I think, some allusions to the importance of political economy. Um, and the international community and agencies like the bank and like USAID can't substitute for the lack of political will at home. And so I think that's a key area where I think your discussions uh, might fruitfully focus. The World Bank can complement certainly those efforts. We can help to generate the evidence which is needed. We can help to finance the investments which are needed. We can help to share the knowledge from around the world. But political commitment and domestic energy at home, I think, is, uh, is much more important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan, uh, uh, you work with USAID. Uh, I used to work with USAID. Um, I note that USAID has produced a, this uh, Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. Um, I know you've come with several ideas to present, but uh, hopefully you'll mention that one. That, that that index uh, somewhat in, in your presentation. If you don't, I'll ask you about it. Uh, uh, there's a disadvantage with being sort of the last person to talk because I heard Isa to talk about a third of the things I was gonna mention and now Jenny's pretty much finished it off. Thank God for the Woman in Agriculture Empowerment Index. Um, I do wanna take one step back because I think some of what we've heard deserves reinforcement. Um, some, we were actually guided not to throw too many statistics at you, uh, but there are a few of them that really serve to explain why this is such a critical, critical topic. One of them is, uh, we heard one of the delegates say, you know, are we going to have enough food? Well, by 2050, they're saying that the world population could be as high as nine billion people. And if that, in fact, is the case, we have to increase our agricultural productivity by about 70%. That is a huge increase. I mention it because it underlines the fact that we can't afford this gender gap in agriculture. We can't afford to be losing that 20 to 30% that we lose simply because women don't have access to the same kinds of resources and assets that men do. So those are important statistics to, to hold on to, I think. Another thing I want to reinforce, and it brings it home to sort of who I am, uh, as Dave mentioned, I work for the US Agency for International Development, and I help to implement the US government's uh, food security initiative, which is called Feed the Future. But more importantly, Feed the Future is, is the US government's way of sort of operationalizing a commitment it made at uh, a G8 event at L'Aquila um, when the Italians had the, the chair of the G8. And I, I mention this even though Dave already did because it's uh, recently sort of been reinforced, this commitment that uh, global leaders made to moving towards global food security uh, raised something like 22, 22.2 billion back in 2009, uh, 22.2 billion dollars in uh, 2009. And just this past week, uh, when global leaders met again at Camp David, they've sort of reinforced, uh, recommitted themselves to this particular issue. Now there's a little bit, there's some tweaking that has gone on in this, in this uh, recommitment. One is sort of really recognizing this idea that it's not going to be the World Bank, it's not going to be USAID, it's not even going to be the World Food Program, although the World Food Program helps to lead the way. But 
the private sector is probably the most important key to sort of sustainable change and sustainable food security and that we really have to uh, work harder to sort of untap that potential in, in countries that, that right now have huge agricultural potential but markets are broken, linkages aren't there and, and the private sector can't actually help to, to spur that kind of growth. Um, the other tweaking that has happened in the recommitment is recognition that this link with nutrition is absolutely key for protecting human capital all across the world. And that if nutrition is key, then women are key also. And I won't repeat uh, Aysa Tuhu's, uh, she, she did it much better than I could ever do anyway. But um, so gender, nutrition, private sector, a real commitment to achieving food security. This isn't just the G8, it's the G20, and it goes beyond, it's the G77. Uh, the principles that have been adopted for helping to achieve food security uh, have been adopted by hundreds of countries now, both those countries working very hard to achieve their own MDG1 and countries investing in those countries to help them do it. All right, I am going to now turn towards this uh, new index. What, what we have found in Feed the Future is that, yeah, we know, we know what works, or we think we know what works. We know we have to increase women's access to uh, land and secure land title. We know we need to increase women's access to agricultural inputs and training. But knowing the what isn't always knowing the how. And I have to tell you, the how is a big, big question. Thank God you've already been given that challenge because I tell you, we do not have the answer, the answers yet. Uh, one of the things we at USAID uh, are doing with partners, we've been working with the International uh, Food Policy Research Institution, IFPRI, We've also been working with DFID and ODI to develop an index that can help us better understand how change occurs, what has to change, and what in specific contexts can really help unlock this potential of women in agriculture and help close the gap. So this index, and I won't go into too much detail, but it looks at five areas that I think will resonate with you. One of the areas, and we call them domains, is to what extent do women have, are they in a decision-making power over what is actually being produced agriculturally and how it's being produced? Another area is what is their access and decision-making power over the household's productive resources? What is their control over the use of their own income? Um, are they participating in any kind of leadership roles in their communities? And do they have control over the use of their own time? And in the pilots that we've done, we've, we've done pilots using this index now in Guatemala, in Uganda, in Bangladesh, and there is one more, it'll come to me, but it's very, very interesting to see that most women have some power in, across these domains, but it's a combination of how much power what kind of power they have in relation to their husbands, or in some cases, relation to their sons, um, and how they use that power that can make a real difference into how they perceive their own empowerment, and in terms of their ability to make the kinds of decisions that will increase their productivity. So we're hoping that by establishing good, solid baselines, we'll be able to measure change and that will help us get to what Jenny said, which is have that data, that sound evidence to be able to bring to our, the country governments that we're working with, the international partners that we're working with to say, listen, this is what is happening in your country. This is what's happening right here. And this is what happens when you provide this kind of training, or this is what happens when you establish better dialogue at a household level between a husband and a wife about using uh, the income that's being generated by the female in the household. 
Uh, we're just at the beginning of this process. We'll be working with the World Bank. Uh, we'll be working with the World Food Program, with FAO, hopefully building up a good sound number of partners that are using the same